birthday, December 11, 2014. We are at the Museum of World War II Boston, and this tape is part of the ongoing Veterans Oral History Project based at the Morris Institute Library in partnership with Natick Pegasus in Natick, Massachusetts. My name is Maureen Sullivan. We are privileged to have with us today Paul Leahy. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? January 7th, 1925. And where were you born? Worcester, Massachusetts. Where do you currently live? Worcester, Massachusetts. Your marital status? Married. Do you have children? No. Tell us a little bit about Worcester growing up. Well, I, I uh, was one of seven children, and uh, my father was a police officer, which was very fortunate because he had a steady job uh, during the, the uh, recession. A lot of mothers and fathers didn't have jobs. Uh, I went and graduated from from uh, Heard Street School, and then went to to uh, Worcester Boys Trade High School. I did not graduate from Worcester Boys Trade High School. I left and went into the service when I was 18 years old. Did you eventually get a diploma from Boys Trade? No, I didn't. I did get a GED in the Army. Did you have brothers or sisters? Um, and you said you mentioned you had seven uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, no, I, I was one of seven children. Uh -huh. I had four sisters and two brothers. Okay. And did any of them go into the military? Yes, both of the brothers did. My oldest brother was federalized with the Massachusetts National Guard in January of 1941 as a buck sergeant. About a year later, he went to OCS and became a second lieutenant. And he rose to the rank of captain during the war. And he was on terminal leave and he went looking for a job and he was told by a lot of people that, well, a lot has changed since you were gone. So uh, he said, there's one job I know I do know. So he went back and re-upped in the Army, spent 32 years in the Army, and retired as a regular Army bird colonel. And what was your brother's name? William. William. How about your other brother? My other brother joined the Air Force, and he was stationed in Keesler Field, Mississippi. And on weekends, he used to go to a Trappist monastery for retreats. And he got so he liked it so much, he decided he wanted to become a Trappist monastery, a monastery, a, tra a monk, a Trappist, not a monastery. <laughs> and uh, he thought that he would go to the monastery that he had been going to all these different weekend uh, retreats. But when he was finally in the, uh, the order, they sent him to Syracuse, New York in the winter time. And they get up at four o'clock in the morning and uh, he wasn't at that very long when he decided he didn't, no longer wanted to be a Trappist monk. So he came home, and he was home, and the Air Force got a hold of him and said, hey, we let you leave the, your, your duty to go into the monastery. Now we understand you're not in the monastery anymore. So it said, however, we will let you finish your... your uh, tour duty in a reserve component. So he enlisted in the Massachusetts National Guard, Air Force National Guard. And uh, he retired from there after 20 years. 
And what was his name? James. All right, let's get back to you. So you were in school when Pearl Harbor was attacked. That's right. And what do you remember about that day? Uh, I was visiting with a very good friend of mine, and it came over the news that, that the Pearl Harbor had been bombed. And uh, none of us had ever even heard of Pearl Harbor. Uh, my father was in the state National Guard because the National Guard had been federalized and they were activated and they were put on duty near the uh, power station. Uh, and the guy that I was with and two other guys that we always hung together. They were 18 months to a year older than I was. In 1942, they decided to join the Air Force together so they could stay together. Well, it turns out they couldn't have gotten any further apart. One of them ended up as a, a waste gunner or a B-24 in Italy. The other one worked as a uh, I can't think of the proper terminology, but we worked as an engineer on a B-29 in the South Pacific and the third guy ended up in South America. So they <laughs> but then that left me as the movie said home alone and I went the day that I turned 18 I went down to my draft board and told them I wanted to have my number come up and they said yeah okay they kind of blew me off but I kept bugging them and they finally did uh, bring my number up so I on on the 18th of, of March, 1943, I went to Fort Devens to be inducted into the Army. Why the Army? Why the Army? Why the Army? My father was, <laughs> was in the infantry during World War I. Mm -hmm. My brother was federalized with an infantry division in World War II, mm -hmm. so I wanted to keep up the tradition. Before you went into the service, uh, did you or your family or friends take part in wartime restrictions such as rationing? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. What do you remember about rationing? I couldn't get enough cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> you were smoking at your age. I was smoking at my age, right. How about uh, Victory Gardens? Scrap drives? Yes, yes. All of that. Scrap drives, uh, victory gardens. The, the girl that I was dating at the time lived right across from Green Hill Park, and they had made a big section of that park into a victory garden. Okay, let's get you back to Devons. Tell us what the first days in the Army were like for you. Well, the first day in the Army... We were in civilian clothes. A sergeant came in, called out a bunch of names. All right, I want you to go down this corridor, and on the right, there's a Dutch door, and it's open, but don't let anybody go in there, and I'll be down in a minute. Okay. So we went down, and there was this Dutch door. So I opened it up and got back and acted like I was selling tickets or something like that, you know? <laughs> So he came back and he said, oh, you're in there, stay there. The rest of you take off your clothes and give them to him. He's going to give you a pair of fatigues to put on. You're going on KP. <laughs> so all I had to do was hand out clothes and take in their clothes. Uh, very shortly thereafter, we got outfitted with 
uniforms, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we had a complete physical. I was in the dental clinic, and the dentist was examining my teeth, and he said, I'm afraid I have some bad news for you, son. I said, what's that? He said, you can't get in the Navy. You're missing a tooth. I said, that's not bad news. That's the best news ever <laughs> since I got here. So I, I passed the, all the physical and everything and raised my right hand and swore to uphold and defend the Constitution. And it was amazing. The people who were not accepted fought tooth and nail to be accepted. And they had to get MPs to take them out of the room. They were so insistent that they had to, had to be accepted. You got your uniform. Got the you're, uniform. You're sworn in. Now what? <laughs> now we go on a train for five days and nights. Uh, and we ate K rations for those five days and nights. <laughs> what an introduction to the army. We got finally got, we had been shunted off to the side a lot because mm -hmm. we were nothing but a bunch of warm bodies. And there would be trains loaded with planes or tanks or trucks or whatever that had priority, so we'd be shut off to the side. Well, we finally got to where we were going. We got off the train on the railroad siding, and a second lieutenant walked up to me and asked me, where are you from, soldier? I said, the hell with where I'm from. Where the hell am I? <laughs> he said, after reminding me that that was no place, no way to talk to an officer, he reminded me that I was at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And it turns out, after I was assigned to a company, that that second lieutenant was my platoon leader. Oopsie. But he didn't hold Rogers. <laughs> and I spent six or seven months uh, basic training. This was a newly formed division, the 75th Infantry Division. I was in C Company, 290th Infantry, and was trained as a rifleman. I w had a seven-day leave in I think it was in September or October. And I, instead of reporting back to my company, I reported to the 28th Infantry Division, which at that time was at Camp Pickett, Virginia, making ready to go overseas. So I jo joined them just before they left to sail for Europe. We landed in Cardiff, Wales, and we spent the next eight months in, in uh, Wales, in a, in a place called uh, Clannabytha, which was spelled L-L-A-Y. <laughs> How they got Clannabytha out of that, I'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go back a little bit to when you were training at um, Fort Leonard Wood. Right. And you were trained to be a rifleman. Tell us a little bit about when it, what went into the training to be a rifleman? Like, what kind of rifle were you using? A, an M1 rifle. And did you receive any additional training during that period? Additional training? Mm -hmm. Like, were you um, in ordinance? Were you doing additional KP, something like that? No, I was, was a, trained as a rifleman in a rifle company. All right. and. Uh, when you were down first in Missouri and then in Virginia, was this like the first time you were away from Massachusetts? Uh, yes. And how, how did that appeal to you as an 18-year-old? Well, I was anxious to get going because, I, as I said before, I was home alone. Uh, all of my friends had, been, uh, had enlisted. And when you were on the ship heading to Wales, uh, did you go straight across or were you zigzagging? 
Uh, as far as I know, we were straight across. I find, find out much uh, after the war that by that time, the Allies had uh, learned how to defeat the German submarines. Although there was rumors all over the ship that we were being followed by submarines, but I don't think anybody ever saw one. And now you're in Wales, and I'm assuming this is your first time in Europe. Yes. Uh, tell us a bit about Wales. Well, it was uh, very hilly. Uh, we spent a lot of time climbing hills. Uh, as I said, we were being trained in the use of explosives. Uh, how to make uh, a satchel pack to place on a, on a tank or something, which we did one night. Uh, how to put a couple of blocks of TNT on a tree to blow down the tree to make it block the road. Uh, we were taught how to lay and pick up minefields. We were like junior grade uh, combat engineers. And how long were you uh, stationed in Wales? Eight months. Then we went to England for a month before we went to, to the continent. So this takes us to um, middle of 1944? Uh, we went into France in July of 44, right? During the time you were in training in Wales and England, um, were you kept updated on events that was happening in Europe? Oh, yeah. And how, was, how did you uh, get that information? from the guy next to me. <laughs> In other words, scuttlebutt. Right, exactly. Stars and Stripes, uh, radio? I don't believe we got Stars and Stripes there. We did once we got it to France, but I don't think we got Stars and Stripes. And during the time you were in Wales and England, did you get to go out and kind of soak up the local culture? Oh yeah, we. I had a three-day pass one time. We went to London. I was absolutely astounded to be in a city that size and the, the, even with all the destruction that had taken place there, there was still a lot of big tall buildings and everything. I was really taken by it. Now what time in July were you sent to France? Uh, not exactly certain, but it was probably a week or so. About, it was about a month after D-Day. So. And where in France did you land? In Omaha Beach. And what was Omaha Beach like a month after the invasion? Very quiet. Nobody was shooting at us. Could you still see the fortifications or the ruins? Oh, yeah. And what were you being told where you were going? We weren't, or at least that, it never filtered down to my level where we were going. But when we got off the, the uh, we came over on a ship, and then we went down a rope ladder off the ship onto a landing craft. And we landed on the beach without even getting our feet wet. And we had came down off this rope ladder with our rifle on our shoulder and our duffel bag on the other shoulder. And when we got to the beach, they said, stack your duffel bags and a truck will come along and pick them up and take them to you tonight. So we all stacked our duffel bags and Never saw those duffel bags again. <laughs> and 
The funny part of that story is about four years after I was home, my mother got a package with my personal effects from that duffel bag and a note that said, uh, please don't get your hopes up. As far as we know, your son is still missing in action. Talk about the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> All right, so your duffel bag is there. You're there with your rifle, the rest of your unit. And what was the name of your unit? Headquarters Company, 1st Battalion, 112th Infantry. Somebody had that written on one of those papers I just signed. And what was your rank at the time? Private. That's another funny story, too. My wife and I had taken a cruise one time, and they, wrote, they were having a little contest, and they said, there are any veterans here? So a bunch of us put our hands up. I think there were five of us up there. And the MC went over to the first guy, and he said, what rank did you hold while you were in the service? He said, second lieutenant. So, okay. So he goes to the next guy, what rank did you hold? He said, first lieutenant. Went to the next guy, what rank did you hold? He said, captain. Went to the next guy, what rank did you hold? He said, major. And I was the last one in line. He said, Go ahead, now tell me you were a colonel, he said. I said, no, I was a PBT. What the hell is a PBT? He said. <laughs> I said, a private. And every time we went on a kind of a, any kind of a tour or anything, people would be hollering, hey, PVT, how are you doing? You know? Well, let's get you back to France. Okay. <laughs> All right, so you're, you've landed at Omaha Beach. You're making your way. Well, we got put on trucks okay. and driven up to our baptism of fire was at St. Lowe. Go ahead, tell us about it. Well, they, we were being shelled in the, in the convoy, so we got off the trucks and scattered to find some place to go, but there was only a few rounds that came, and they stopped, and so we got back on the trucks and went, kept going. Nobody was hurt. What were you being told about the enemy? Oh, a lot of different things. They don't like to fight at night. They don't like cold steel. Uh, that, uh, we've been told a lot that they were far more, uh, far better soldiers than we were because they had been at it a lot longer than we had. You know, at St. Lowe? Yes. Tell us what happened next. Uh, well, we did some fighting for, for St. Lowe, but it was, it wasn't the uh, real battle of St. Lowe. And then we, we uh, went into a bivouac area and pitched our tents and, uh, I don't know exactly when we first got into a fight with anybody. Uh, and as I said, I was in the A.M.P. platoon. But I didn't have any duties in the A.M.P. platoon because they weren't called for. So I was just another rifleman on the line. Could you explain a little bit about what an A.M.P. platoon is? Well, the A stands for ammunition, and if the occasion ever arises that the rifle companies or the weapons company need ammunition, it's our job to get it up to them. And a Pioneer was, uh, uh, as I said before, we were kind of junior grade uh, combat engineers. We were tra trained in the use of explosives, the, the uh, 
setting of and the disarming of uh, booby traps and the picking up and laying of minefields. And what was the general, ad, uh, like the general movement of the war late summer into fall of 1944 when you were there? Well, in August of 1944, we were t taken off the line, put on trucks and driven to Paris. And we marched down the Champs-Élysées on the 29th of August, 1944, to help the French people celebrate the liberation of Paris, which had been liberated four days earlier by a French armored division and an American uh, infantry division. What was that like? Oh, <laughs> I used to say, that there were two people in the world that were uh, conservatives. They, one of them was Sherman when he said war was hell, and the other one was the guy who called Paris Gay Paris. <laughs> so that must have been a pretty interesting time. <laughs> oh, it was a very interesting time. What happened after Paris was liberated? Back, well, we went back on the trucks and back on the line again. And where was the line? Where was the line? Where was the line? Oh, it was in France, but I have no idea where. Mm -hmm. You're still A&P platoon, still riflemen. Tell us what's uh, happening. Well, I, as I said, we, we were, uh, because we didn't have any duties as A and P people, we were just another rifleman on the line. And the first day I went into combat, my, the T O and E called for my to be carrying a carbine. And the first day in, I did carry a carbine. But the second day, I got rid of that carbine and picked up an M1 rifle. Incidentally, and while we were in Paris. I sold my carbine for fifty dollars to somebody with the FFI, with French forces in the interior. Tell us the difference between a carbine and an M1. A carbine had a magazine, and it had, it fired thirty caliber machine gun, after uh, thirty caliber uh, bullets but it didn't have the range of an M1 rifle. Uh, and I don't think it was as accurate either as an M1 rifle. That's why I parted company with it and picked up an M1 rifle. Okay, tell us what happened next. Uh, well, we did a lot of fighting. We. Uh, place where I got my introduction to the A part of A&P, we had gone into an attack at like at 4 o'clock in the morning. We captured the sentries that they had out, and they had a choice of either dying or making the noise to alert the people, and they opted not to die. So we picked them up as prisoners, and we, somebody else was designated to take them back to headquarters for interrogation. And we went into the bivouac area of the Germans, and they were coming out of their tent, half-dressed, no shoes on, no rifle. What the hell is going on here, you know? and. Uh, wasn't long before they found out what was going on. And we were successful in knocking the Germans off the hill. And the, the uh, motto of the infantry is take the high ground and hold it. Uh, they had the high ground, but they didn't hold it. But they really wanted it back again because they had uh, attacked three different times to try and knock us off the hill. And uh, we and this is where I got this thing here. This is a presidential unit citation, and that's what we for 
knocking them off the hill and holding them. You got a presidential unit citation. Now, in that particular engagement, you mentioned that this was the first time you used the A in A and uh, P. What were your exact duties at that uh, particular time? Carrying boxes like this up a hill to, to, to either a rifle company or a weapons company and carrying mortars like this is a 30 millimeter mortar and this is an 81 millimeter mortar carrying those up to the uh, the rifle companies use the smaller ones and the weapons company use the larger ones so you did a lot of carrying a lot of carrying right and how long did it, this engagement last? Uh, pretty much all day, from 4 o'clock in the morning when we started, until the Germans finally decided that they weren't going to be able to knock us off it. And of course, when you're, in, when you're on the hill and they're trying to take it, you, it's, you're a, a an advantage because you can look down and see where they are. So they lost a lot of people on that engagement. Well, we did too, but not as many as they did. So you're not what, around 19 years old? And I was you're 19 years old. And you're firing at the enemy. What were you feeling at that time? Well, it's either you or him. <laughs> Tell us what happened next. Uh, well, we were engaged in different uh, skirmishes with the, with the enemy. But uh, in November of uh, 44, we went into an attack trying to take a town of Schmidt, Germany, because it was the main supply route for the entire sector. So it was a very valuable piece of real estate. And we were supposed to go in and knock the Germans out of uh, Schmidt. And we, when we went into the attack, they said, your tanks will be up to support you later. Well, the tanks never came. The, the uh, terrain that they had to traverse was impossible for them to get up to. to uh, so very early on in the, in the battle, we captured 11 German prisoners. And the sergeant in charge told three of us to take those 11 prisoners into the cellar of that house over there and stay there until the battle quiets down. When it quiets down, take him into headquarters for interrogation. So we were sitting in that house with these 11 guys. We put them in the coal bin. <laughs> and I tell you, the coal bin, you could eat off the floor because whoever lived there had not only used all the coal, but swept up all the dust and everything else to, to burn. So they were all sitting, leaning up against the wall in the coal bin. And we could see German soldiers marching by the window because they all had these high black boots on. And uh, all of a sudden, there was a huge explosion. And it turned out it, there was a tank in the driveway firing. So one of the guys went up to see what was going on. He looked out the window, he saw the tank. He came back down and he said, do any of our tanks have muzzle brakes on them? We said, no, none of our, then that's not our tank. It's a German tank and it's firing in the direction that we just came from. Well, it turned out it was a real disaster. Uh, while we were sitting there and all these guys are going by the house and finally one guy came in the house and if I were going to, I was trained so that if I was going to go in that house and do what he did, I would have thrown the hand grenade down first and then gone down and see what was left. 
And this guy came down to, marching down the stairs. And I'm thinking to myself, I hope he doesn't have any hand grenades. But he did. He had two or three hand grenades. They call them potato mashers, the shape of the German hand grenades. Uh, and he, well, another thing about those hand grenades, they were packaged by uh, people who were captured by the Germans or something. So they were uh, sabotaging a lot of these. They had uh, hand grenades that would go off uh, five seconds later. They had others that would go off maybe an hour later. And they were, had different color bands on them. And the, the people putting them together were changing the bands. So the poor guy, when he pulled a pin on the grenade, he never knew whether it was going to go off in five seconds or five days. <laughs> so I take it the gentleman heading down the stairs was a German soldier? Yes. Okay. Yes. Tell us what happened next. <laughs> well, we were talking to him, trying to get him to join the other 11 guys that we had. And they were helping us. They were saying, look at, look at what they did. They dressed Smitty's wound. They gave us Zigaretten on the Mittag Dessen, which is lunch. Uh, so these are good guys. These are good guys, you know. So we were talking about having him join those 11 as a, instead of taking the three of us as prisoners. And he wasn't, he was wavering. And there was a barn attached to the house that we was in, that we were in, and, and it caught fire. There was a well in the cellar that we were in. We set up a bucket brigade with 12 German soldiers and three American soldiers getting water from the well and carrying it upstairs and trying to throw it on the fire to put it out. And of course, it was, we couldn't do a thing with it. So we knew that sooner or later the house was going to catch fire as well. So we left the house, all of us. And when we did, we walked into a group of German soldiers and it was all over as far as we were concerned. Uh, but again, these prisoners that we had were talking to the guys that were taking us prisoner. Oh, these are good guys. Yeah, oh, put your hand. We, you know, everybody's walking around with their hands up. Oh, no, put your hands down. Put your hands down. <laughs> But uh, we, went, we were taken prisoner anyway. <laughs> and we were being marched back, uh, I don't think for interrogation, because most of us wouldn't know any, enough to know what was going on. But we were being marched back, and all of a sudden, there was probably 35 or 40 of us that had been taken prisoner. And there were a half a dozen German soldiers marching us back. And all of a sudden they stopped and all the guards got together and they had a big confab. And then they decided, no, we're not going to go down the road any further. We're going into the woods. And I and a lot of other guys in there thought, this is it. We're never going to get out of these woods. They're going to take us into the woods and shoot us. So I had my cartridge belt on, no cartridges, but I had my cartridge belt on. I had a first aid packet. I had a canteen. And I was taking them off and throwing them off to the side so the Germans wouldn't get them. And it turns out that uh, it was a good thing to do because during the Battle of the Bulge, the Germans had Germans dressed as American soldiers, and I mean dressed as American soldiers. They had our boots on, they had our socks on, they had our shorts on, our T-shirts, even our dog tags. Uh, 
that they were using to infiltrate the American line. If you saw the movie, The Battle of the Bulge, you know that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember Battleground, too. What's that? Battleground with... Uh, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, you're in the woods, but since you're here, looks Turns like... out <laughs> that they were just taking a shortcut. <laughs> Instead of going down one street and back up another one, somebody who was aware, aware of that area uh, just uh, cut across Shorty and... Uh, we ended up near a, a uh, looked like a hunting lodge or something like that. And there were other people coming in, and a staff car drove up. Two majors from the American Army were in the car. And the German officer who was talking to us and telling us a pack of lies, it turns out, but... He said, look, guys, we got a couple of things we got to do here. Speak flawless English. Uh, we get all squared away. You're going to go inside. There are beds in there. It's warm in there. We're going to feed you. Okay, so everybody's paying attention to get, get out of the cold and get, get into that hunting lodge. But then this staff car comes up with the two majors, and he reverted to German. That's so zwei Mayor, two majors. He must have thought the war was over, you know. Uh, well, anyway, they finished their, whatever they were going to do, and we went into the house. There were no beds in there. It was not warm in there, and they didn't feed us. <laughs> Just a point of clarification. When you were captured by the Germans, were you captured by the Wehrmacht, the regular German army? Yes. No. Tell us what happened next. Well, we, we get out of the uh, hunting lodge or whatever it was, and they put us on trucks and they took us to Stalag 12A, which was the worst time I had while I was a prisoner. Fortunately, we were only there for a few days. And then they put us on, uh, on a train. And again, we had five days and nights on a train with no food or water. A honey bucket that they had in the, in the middle of the car to use to relieve yourself. Uh, And on the top of the boxcars, there's a little, maybe three or four inch high, but a yard and a half long, that you could drop down and you could look out. And somebody would do that most of the time, look and see, try to find out where we are or what's going on. Or, well, one time they, the train was stopped, and one of the guys got boosted up there and was looking out the the top of the thing, and he got shot in the head. Of course, he fell back into the car, and he was dead, and we tried to make enough noise to, that they would open the door and say, you know, take this dead man out of here. And they finally did and uh, took him out. And then every time after that that they counted, they would be missing a man. And I forget how many of us were in the box cap, probably close to 100. And when you laid down at night, everybody had to lay down just like this. There was no room to go anywhere else. And if one guy had to turn over, everybody had to turn over. <laughs> uh, and we finally got to Stalag 2B, which is a much better uh, compound. It had prisoners there from a lot of different nationalities, but it was verboten to fraternize between the, the different uh, nationalities. And one time, 
I was in the French barracks, and the French people had been, this sounds silly, but uh, being a prisoner of war, after five years, you get a lot, you know a lot more than you did for my, my I was a prisoner for six months. So uh, the longer you're at it, the more proficient you become, it usually. And the same held true for those guys that were prisoners of war from 1940 when they were over, their country was overrun. They would go into town and work uh, and they had access to the picking up anything that the night, uh, New Year's Eve, we had a bottle of schnapps that we bought from the French with American cigarettes. Uh, and the, the four of us that would travel together all the time uh, split the bottle of schnapps. Uh, but we were in the French barracks one day, and a German soldier walked up to me and started talking to me in French because the Germans, a lot, a lot of the Germans could speak French and vice versa. So he's talking to me in French, and I said, pas compris. And he said, pas compris, pas compris, bist du Franzosen? I said, nein. Amerikanisch, Amerikanisch, Host, Host. And I had a piece of white bread with jam on it that, that one of the French uh, prisoners had given me. And I was eating it, you know, and it roused, roused. I said, okay, and I started out, nine, nine, put the bread down. <laughs> so I <laughs> pass up by a piece of white bread with jam on it. At any time when you were a POW, were you mistreated by the Germans? Uh, not really. I, I'll tell you a story about uh, in the army, death to go to KP. You know, that's, nobody wants to do that. As a POW, everybody wanted to go because you could get to steal a little bit of food. So I had... Uh, they had taken all of our uniforms and everything away from us. So I had a pair of pants. I don't know. They told me they were made out of wood, but I don't know. I, can't, I could never <laughs> verify that. And I had a, a British jump jacket on, and it was much bigger than I was. So I'm on KP, and I'm thinking, hmm. I tied the thing around my gut, and then I was loading potatoes in both sides, you know, and I even put some down my legs. I tied the, le the bottom of the legs, and I put potatoes down there, too, so we're being marched back now to the barracks, and I'm... <laughs> Boss says, Lowe's, you know, what's wrong? What's wrong? I said, I spent conk. I'm sick, you know. <laughs> okay, he, he bought that originally, and then he thought, no, nah, there's something else wrong. And so he takes his rifle off his shoulder, and he's trying to prod me with the bayonet, right? And he isn't hitting me at all. He's just hitting potatoes. <laughs> so he, he, he made me stop and take every potato that I had out of me. And then when we finally got to the barracks, he belted me in the back with his uh, rifle. But that was, uh, well, th that was probably the worst thing that, that the soldiers did. But then we were out on commando. 30 of us left Stalag 2B and took a train ride on civilian trains, not uh, boxcars, to a place in Poland was a small farming village, and half of us would work on a farm, threshing wheat, pitching hay, uh, spreading manure, all the things that you do on a, on a farm. And the other half would be down splitting logs, making charcoal for the wood-burning vehicles in the German army. 
And one time while we were down there splitting logs, I was up on a wagon throwing the logs off to the people who were on the ground splitting them. And off in the distance, you could see this, because uh, this was in the winter time, and there was a, a small horse trying to haul a load of logs up a little incline. And he wasn't being very good at trying to get those logs up. And the guy in charge of this operation, a German, who was always in black leather, uh, he took a, a meter long log, 39 inch log, and he belted that horse and probably broke all of its ribs. And I called him everything but a white man. <laughs> and I don't recall exactly how the wagon got up the hill, because I'm busy throwing these logs off. All of a sudden, he comes up behind me on the truck. I didn't see him. It wasn't a truck, it was a wagon. Come up behind me, took one of those, and he belted me and knocked me off the wagon. And he said to me in English, I speak English. <laughs> so he knew exactly what I was calling him when I called him everything but a white man. Okay, Paul, let's, uh, let's get into a little more general information about life in a POW camp. You mentioned trying to steal some extra food. What, was, uh, what would be a typical meal? Soup. And there were some awful small ribs in there. So you don't know what they came from. Did you ever receive Red Cross packages? Yes. Not the way they were designed. They were designed for one man for, for a week. The best I ever had was three people per box per week. And usually it was much more than that could be five or six people on the same package for a week. And what would be in those Red Cross packages? Uh, there was some powdered milk. There was coffee, uh, jam, chocolate bars, cigarettes, crackers. And they kept a lot of prisoners alive, even though they weren't handed out the way they were supposed to be. And one time at Stalag 2B, they came looking for volunteers to unload a uh, boxcar full of Red Cross parcels. So everybody was eager to go help them unload these Red Cross parcels. We never saw one of them. We filled the trucks up and the trucks drove off with them. I take it the Germans kind of... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, they didn't have a lot to eat themselves. Uh, with the, um, say with the cigarettes or other items in the Red Cross packages, did you ever do trading with the German guards for yes. other... Yes. Uh, for example? Oh... <laughs> One of the four guys that I hung with as a prisoner of war, a guy from uh, New Hampshire, uh, he couldn't speak French or German, but he used to go and barter with these people. Uh, he'd take a mirror, for instance, and go off. And he'd come back with something far more valuable than the mirror. <laughs> uh, he was our go-to guy when you wanted to, to get something. Uh, but we did, uh, almost everybody bartered with the, with the Germans for bread. The bread we got was, was uh, black bread that had been baked and it was, it was in sawdust. And if we, were, <laughs> if we were starving, we ate the bread, sawdust and all. 
If we were hungry, then we would cut the sawdust off the bread. Um, how about, uh, what was inside the barracks like? Just like the things you've seen in the, in the, uh, the Stalags, not the Stalags, but the uh, concentration camps where they were stacked up, except we weren't stacked as high as they were. We're, They were like three or four tiers, and it was a, it was a board that you were sleeping on. They give you a a, a mattress cover filled with straw. And that's where the lice came from. And you mentioned what you were wearing. Was that pretty much what you wore during your whole time? Pretty much so, yes. What about medical care? In case you were sick or there was an accident? I don't know of anybody that uh, was sick or had any... But I, I would imagine that they had, if, that, if those things did happen, they would be provided with medical care. Mm -hmm. How about escape attempts? I never thought of it. Did anybody else did? Oh, yeah. There were, there were people there who were, were always plotting to get out of there. And where exactly was uh, Starlock to be? Was it uh, near the Polish border? I have no idea. It was in Hammerstein, wherever that is. Mm -hmm. And you also, of course, spent some time in Poland. And we were on, on commando, right. Commando with a K is a work party. Now, with a C, it's a, it's a British elite forces, but... Uh, and how long were you in Poland? Probably two and a half to three months. And aside from that incident with the horse, were you treated better or about the oh, same? Oh yeah, it was better because we, we had fresh vegetables. Uh, <laughs> we had chicken. Uh, well, as a, one of the things in that bag is a uh, the, the headline of the article is Leahy Traps Chickens While Prisoner of the Nazis. We were right next door to a chicken farm and we would put little crumbs and stuff on the this side of the barbed wire fence. Chicken would stick its head through, <coughs> twist his neck off, go into the john, bleed him into the john, put them under your jacket, take them inside into the kitchen. We had a little kitchen. They built a building specifically to house us 30 prisoners. And there was a kitchen that we could use to cook our meals and stuff. And they have a big pot of boiling hot water, stick them in and then pull all the feathers and burn all the feathers in the, in the fire. And we'd have chicken, chicken soup, or some way of chicken. Uh, and we had two guards initially, a, a young Hitler youth kid and an old man that was old enough to be a father to most of us, and he took very good care of us. He was a really decent son. <laughs> they were taking him away from us. He was going back up to the Russian front. So we said to him, we want you to come over and eat with us. And he said, no, 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 please. We want you to come over and eat with us. And finally he said, no, okay. So he came over. We put a mess kit full of fried chicken in front of him. He sat there and cried like a baby, you know. What's wrong with this picture? They're eating better than we are. <laughs> You were just mentioning Russian Front here in Poland. Were you aware that the Russian Front was uh, coming toward you? <laughs> Absolutely. One day, a whole group of German officers came in, and blah, 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 blah. 
we had people with us who could speak German and let the Germans know that they could speak German. But we also had people with us who could speak German but did not let the Germans know that they could speak German. So they'd listen to these guys. And so after the officers left, the kid, one of the guys is telling us, yeah, they're going to pick us up tomorrow morning. Uh, and they're going to truck us out of here. Well, the reason for that is we go to bed at night, we could see artillery flashes off in the distance. And that they, were, they kept getting closer and closer, so they wanted to get us out of there. They didn't want us to be liberated. So they put us on a truck and drove us for 28 miles, and then we marched for about 600 miles. And the old man had left. He'd gone to the Russian front. The young kid that was left back. Somebody had a pair of uh, wire cutters, and they cut a hole in the barbed wire fence big enough to drive a Mack truck through. And uh, probably 10 or 15 guys left and went down to the barracks where the uh, Lithuanian women and girls were they were prisoners as well, but they had far better access than we did to the, to the town. Uh, <laughs> one of them uh, used to come up to visit me on Sunday morning, and somebody would come in and say, hey, Leahy, your girlfriend's out there. And I'd go out there. <laughs> we called a Fumsen, which is 15 in German. Uh, I, I'd, to this day, I don't know what her real name was, but she'd come up. And I'd go out and we'd try to converse. She couldn't speak English. I couldn't speak German or uh, Lithuanian. But we'd managed to somehow get across what we were trying to say. And uh, one day I had a pair of gloves that uh, were army issue gloves that had a fake leather palm on them. And they were really in tough shape. And she said, to, a glove in German is hand shoe. So she said, give me your hand shoes and I'll mock, I'll mock them better. I'll make them better. See, <laughs> she bought them back. There was a piece of leather, not fake leather, but real leather on both palms, all stitched in. <laughs> Did a great. She had an uncle that lived in Cicero, Illinois, and she said she was going to visit him when she went to Cicero, and she wanted to come to my house and visit me too. But that never happened. Oh, sad to hear that. So um, after you were taken uh, 28 miles on the 600-mile march, where, where were you ending up here? We ended up in Germany. Back in Germany, uh, southern Germany, central Germany? Uh, Salzwedel, I don't know where. I don't know where that is in relationship. Mm -hmm. It might be in that diary that I have there. Okay. And this was uh, another POW camp? No, we, we, we watched like this. You know, we try to get away from the Russians. And then the next thing you know, we go this way and try to get away from the Americans. So we did a lot of, that's how it came to be 600 miles. Uh, uh. And we're now talking about the like winter of 45, early spring? Winter of 45. And Terrible, cold. Yeah, I remember the winter of 45 being particularly nasty. <laughs> That's right, it was. It was the coldest winter they've had in about 100 years. And we didn't have any proper shoes. I was wearing wooden shoes like the Dutch people wear. Uh, no blankets to sleep in, you know, at night when we... They used to... Uh, put us up in a plowed field because it made it easy for them to keep an eye on us, you know, instead of putting us in some place where we could be sheltered in the in a forest or something, 
they would never be able to keep tabs on us. So we lay in a frozen field and many nights I walked all night instead of laying down to go to sleep because I was afraid I wouldn't get wake, wake up again. Finished the 600-mile march. You're in, what was that place again? Salzvedel. Salzvedel. Salzvedel was a town about the size of Worcester, and it had six large hospitals in there, just like Worcester does. And they were housing Allied prisoners of war. So the, ho the town had never been bombed. But after they turned all these POWs lo loose in there, Looked like it had been bombed for about a week straight. Uh, we went into a hotel, told him we wanted a room. No rooms, no rooms. He, he could speak English. He was German, but he could speak English. No rooms. So, oh, come on now. We wanted a room. So he took us upstairs and, I'll show you, he said. Okay, so we'll go up and there's a big... Off limits, American Red Cross. I said, I'd like to see what's in that room. No, that's American Red Cross. I said, I would like to see what's in that room. So he opened up the room. There were four or five cardboard suitcases tied up with rope. And I said to myself that the American Red Cross doesn't travel this way. <laughs> so I said to the to the uh, owner of the hotel, I guess, or the manager or whatever, I said, that's not American Red Cross. I don't know who it is, but it's not American Red Cross. So we opened the window and threw all the suitcases out into the aisle, out, out the alley, I should say, out into the alley and told them, this is going to be our room. Give us the key. We actually never went back there. <laughs> we didn't sleep there that night. I frankly, I don't even know where we did sleep. But uh, we wanted to get something to eat. So we went into a bakery, and there's a big long line of Germans with their little coupons, and they'd give them the coupon and they'd get a little tiny piece of bread. We went in, and there was a, like any other bakery, the big stack of uh, shelves on wheels and they were all, it was loaded with fresh bread. Well, yeah, we'll take that. So we took the thing and wheeled it out the front door and there was a, a column of American tanks coming through. And so we'd go down and say, you want some fresh bread? You want some fresh bread? And the guy, who the hell are you guys? Anyway, what are you doing? <laughs> and we had to tell him, you know, we're we're Americans. We may not look it, but we are Americans, and we just liberated as prisoners of war. Oh, okay, thanks. And they take the bread. So then we went down to the uh, train station, and there was cases and cases of eggs. And so we said we wanted some eggs. And there was a French uh, prisoner of war guarding him. He had a weapon. I'm not even sure if it was loaded or not, but he had a weapon. And there was an American MP there, and he had a Thompson submachine gun. He took the submachine off, fired into the ceiling. <laughs> Frenchman took off. We took a little four-wheel truck, put a case of eggs on it. Uh, we had this all this bread. We went to a store. They had margarine. We took a suitcase full of margarine. And with the bread and the eggs and margarine, we went knocked on the door. It turns out they were uh, Lithuanian women that were living there. And they took us in and cooked uh, the biggest fry pan they have would hold six eggs. And everybody would get six eggs at a time. <laughs> and one guy ate 18 of them. He ate three different loads. Yeah, and it was not good for you because it most of us got sick from eating that. Uh, the same way when we were liberated, 
The first meal we had under American control was uh, chicken fricassee. And we'd eat and eat and eat, and then we'd get sick and go off in the woods and throw up, and then we'd come back and eat some. <laughs> not fun being hungry. Definitely not. So just a matter of clarification, uh, you were still a prisoner of war until you got to Salt Beetle, right? That's right. And then somewhere along the way, the American tanks came in? Well, the last night we marched into what had been a Hitler youth camp. And there were beds in there, but there were no mattresses. <laughs> but even sleeping on the wire uh, was better than sleeping on the floor. So we went in there and we woke up in the morning and found out that all the German guards had taken off. That stopped my nose from running. Uh, so we were standing around the uh, gate, the entrance to the place, and a German officer came along, and he spoke flawless English, and he said, look, guys, just stay right where you are, and before the day is over, you'll be liberated. But if you go up there, there's a war going on. So I would advise you to stay here and wait. OK, well, the impetuousness of youth, we couldn't, some of us just couldn't wait. So we started up towards Salzwedel. And we saw an American gun carrier coming down the road. And we could look off in the distance, and there were uh, German soldiers outside of the uh, tree line. And these people started firing at them because they all went into the, uh, into the woods. And when they started firing, we drove into a ditch alongside the road. And the next thing you know, we were looking into the wrong end of a 50 caliber machine gun. And of course, we tried to help. We're Americans. Yeah, sure you are. <laughs> no, seriously, we are. We're American prisoners of war. Because none of us you could recognize by our uniforms or anything. So we finally convinced them. They give us an M1 rifle, but no ammunition. And uh, we were starting at the town, and there was a little, a little bakery. So we went into the bakery. And there was nothing in, the, in any of the cases. But up on the top shelf, there were pyramids of cookie box, boxes. Get the cookies down here. So he takes down the cookie boxes and sets them on the counter. He'd given us each one a, a cookie box. There was just nothing in them, just the boxes. You know. And he thought that was funny. He didn't think it was funny before we left because we broke every case in the place with the butt of the rifle. <laughs> he wasn't laughing anymore. I take it that was not the same bakery that you were telling us before? That what? About the, um, the bakery with uh, no, no, the no, bread. No, that no, that was in town where there was a, uh, they were baking bread. OK. Yeah. All right, Paul, you're now liberated. You've yes. You've been trying to eat. Tell us what happened next. Uh, We're now in about what, April 45? Yes. Okay. Well, after the day we spent in, in Salzwedel, they we were rounded up and told that we had to go to the airport, that they were going to fly us uh, out of the airport. and. But where's the airport? It's oh, about three miles down the road. Uh, every every store, every bakery, every everything, and they had a rack of bikes out in front of them because that was a major mode of transportation. So we each helped ourselves with a bike and rode down to the airport. 
and I swear to God, there was a stack of bikes down there as high as the ceiling. And they took our bikes and <laughs> threw them up on top of the pile. Yeah, because we didn't need the bikes anymore. Yeah. So uh, a lot of people had done what we'd done, I guess, take, taking people's bikes away from them and, and uh, ridden to the airport. We got into a building and we had some rations. Uh, I don't know exactly what they were, but we, were, we put a, a fire in a uh, wash basin to heat the things up. And it was, it was a place where there was uh, film all over the place. There must have been some outfit that was taking uh, pictures and come back and, and produce them and so on. So there was a lot of film laying around. And somebody knocked something on the floor, and the next thing you know, there's the whole, whole building's on fire. We get out of there, but the whole building burned down. And we were told to line up. We were going to get on an airplane. Four of us that had always, <coughs> always been together get down to, the, to get on the plane. Three of us get on. And the last guy, they said, no, can't put any more on because that'll be too much weight. Oh, no, no, please, we've been together all this time. No, 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 he'll, you'll see him at the next stop anyway. He'll be on the next plane. They taxied the plane over to a machine shop. They put on a drill press, an engine lathe, a milling machine. <laughs> but they wouldn't let this guy who weighed about 100 pounds on. Before we go any further, talk about the, you've been talking about the four men together. Okay. Tell us about the other three. Okay. Lester Marsh was from uh, New Hampshire, and he was older than the other three of us. Uh, and as I said before, he was our go-to guy if you wanted to get something. Uh, Cecil Feinstein who was Jewish and could speak German or Yiddish uh, and was very helpful to us on this road because all this time we were on the road, we would, <laughs> we would talk to him and say, well, you could speak the language. You, you, know, you go do this and you go do that. And, I know, I don't know. Well, well, I would do it if I could speak German, you know, yeah, like hell. So he, he went into town one day and got a rabbit. And they skinned the rabbit for him and gave him the whole rabbit. We couldn't do anything to cook it, so we ate the thing raw. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he was very instrumental in, in going into town and talking their language and getting something for us to eat. Uh, the next one was uh, George Ravel, who was uh, from Pennsylvania. Uh, I think of the name of the town in Pennsylvania now. And I think he was Jewish also. One time I was in the hospital, in, in an army hospital in uh, Pennsylvania. Red Cross girl come in and said, we're going to take a group into uh, the Roger Theater in this town, what the town was that he lived in. And uh, I was thinking, no, I don't know. And then I said, wait a minute, that's where George Ravel lives. So I said, yeah, yeah, I'll go, I'll go. So, okay, we got in, went, drove down, got to the theater, and she said they were told to him to have the safe seats for us. But they didn't do that. So just go in, see a complete show. There was a movie and a floor show. Just go in and see a complete show and then come back out again and we'll meet here at the box office. Okay, I went in one door and out another, went to a phone and called George. 
George came down. We went to a little club that he belonged to down in the cellar of the building. And they had, <laughs> they had nickel beers. And uh, after he and I got talking, all these people around were, were buying us beer. We couldn't spend a nickel to get a beer. So we drink a beer, and all of a sudden I said, hey, what time is it getting to be anyway? So they, oh, I think we better go up and to the Raja Theater and find out if they're gone yet. You know. So we go up, and the girl at the ticket booth, is that group from the Red Cross left? Oh, you must be the guy they were looking for, <laughs> she said. I said, oh, oh. <laughs> so George says, not to worry, I'll drive you to back to uh, the, the hospital. It's okay. So we drive back to the hospital, and the, the Red Cross lady has them all lined up, and she's counting noses again to make sure there really is one missing. So I went over to him, and I said, I'm sorry, but I'm the guy you're looking for. So, well, you will never leave this space again. You did George walked over and he said, excuse me, ma'am, can I talk to you for a minute? To this day, I don't know what he said to her, but she forgot everything she was going to do to me <laughs> after what he said to her. <laughs> All right, well, let's get you back. To, uh, I take it you're on the plane? On the plane. And who got left behind, by the way? The side. Okay. Yeah. All right, you're on the plane, and where are you heading? To France. We stopped at one of the places that was a World War I battle site, and they let us off the plane to kind of stretch our legs. And we found uh, boxes of 10 and 1 rations. They were supposed to sustain five people for for... I think it was five people for two days or something like that. We stacked a bunch of them on the, on the plane. So again, eating and eating and eating and getting sick and sick and sick. <laughs> and after that? We landed at uh, Camp Lucky Strike in France. They were all named after cigarettes. And I take it this is now sort of like late April into May? Yes. And what, what do you remember about VE Day, May 7th, 1945? Uh, were, were you at Camp Lucky Strike at, when it happened? No, I think we were on, uh, on route to America on the boat. Mm -hmm. So you were at Camp Lucky Strike for a short period? Yes. Okay. Just long enough to get outfitted with fresh clothes and stuff, have a physical mm -hmm. examination. Getting the fresh clothes must have been nice. Yes, yes. And do you remember what boat you were heading toward, uh, back to America on? No, I don't. But, uh, and you were uh, on the Atlantic? Yes. When BE Day was announced, what was that like? Oh, it was very nice. We were considered ramps. I don't know if you ever heard that expression or not. Ramps? Yeah. Recovered Allied military personnel. And we were treated like kings on that trip back to America. And they had some Dutch Marines on board. Yeah. I don't know what their function was on board, but they were uh, probably the same as our Marines are on board a ship. But uh, they would come up to us and talk to us and with the bat the real heavy accent, you know. Oh, but we are not Sherman. You know, we are Dutch. We are not Sherman. <laughs> How long were you on that ship? Uh, I would guess about a week. 
And where did you land? In Boston. Did you get to go back to Worcester first? Did you, did you get to go back to Worcester? Yes. Well, we went to, to Fort Devens from Boston. And we were there for a few days before we were turned loose to go home. My folks came in to pick me up. Well, my, my folks and my uncle, because my father never owned a car. <laughs> well, he was a police officer and uh, had seven kids. So there was a family of nine that he had to feed and clothe. He wasn't buying many clothes. <laughs> I mean, many automobiles. <laughs> Were you discharged at Fort Devens? Uh, no. no, no. I was sent home for two months recuperation leave. And at the end of the two months recuperation leave, we went to, to uh, Lake Placid, New York. The Army had taken over this retreat that millionaires usually stayed at. And it was like dying and going to heaven. You know, in the Army, they have breakfast at uh, 6 to 7.30 or something like that. Up, up at Camp, uh, uh, yeah, what's the name of the place I mentioned? Lake Placid. <laughs> Lake Placid, New York. Uh, the, Breakfast was like 7 to 10.30 or something like that. And you, you went in and sat down, and a waitress came over and took your order and gave you whatever you wanted to eat. And while you were gone, somebody else would come in and make your bed. I, honest to God, it was unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. And how long were you at Lake Placid? Two weeks. What happened after that? I was sent to... Cap Gruber, Oklahoma. I was assigned to a chemical mortar battalion. And chemical this, mortar. And to this day, I've never seen a chemical mortar. <laughs> Were you um, going to be sent to Japan? Or was yes. this, yeah, uh, that's yes. what I thought. <laughs> Yep. So they were getting ready. Uh, they were getting you ready to go to Japan. That's right. That's right. But something happened along the way, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. A couple of atomic bombs. August 1945. You're in Oklahoma. Bombs get dropped. Tell us what happened next. Well, the company we were in had a a, uh, a fund that they could use to buy food and stuff like that. They told us that if you want something to eat, you go into the mess hall, you can cook whatever you want to eat. All we ask is that you clean up after yourself. And if there's something you want and it's not there, let us know and we'll get it for you, right? So it was uh, insane. Well, first of all, on, v on VJ Day, there was so much weapon firing that I wouldn't even venture out of the barracks because everybody was so elated over what had happened and they were firing weapons into the air. Uh, so that, then we had to stay there and, and uh, we could eat in, in the thing anytime we wanted. Uh, there was a swimming pool and a kid from Worcester was running the swimming pool. <laughs> and they had off, 
offices times to go, they had nurses times to go, uh, enlisted men time to go. But this kid was from Worcester, so we could go anytime we wanted. <laughs> Good to have connections. Yeah. <laughs> So how long were you stationed in Oklahoma? Uh, not very long, not very long. And what happened after that? I was discharged at uh, Camp Seabit, Alabama. And when were you discharged? When? When? October 20th, 1945. Still a private? Still a private. And what, aside from the presidential unit citation, what other honors or commendations did you receive? Well, this is the European Theater of Operation Medal, mm -hmm. the Bronze Star, and the other one is the POW Medal. And how did you earn the Bronze Star? That was the day I carried ammunition until I dropped it from exhaustion. You were discharged in Alabama. Did you go back to Massachusetts? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they gave me a train ticket and a few bucks. And Said, see you later. <laughs> yeah, see you later, right. And so you're back in Worcester. What did you do afterward? Well, the first job I had was working for the David Clark Company, and they were making uh, high-altitude suits for the, well, one of them was a test pilot. Uh, they also made a lot of suits later on for the astronauts. But I was, I had a job, I was working in the, in the, uh, first of all, they made, uh, women's underwear, men's underwear. And I was a cutter, and they would have this whole table laid out with the pattern on top, and you'd just go around with your knife in it. And I was doing that one day, and the, the, David Clark was the owner of the company. And he come out, and he took a tape around my thigh and around my leg, and he said, come with me, Paul. I said, okay, so I went in, and he walked in, and he said, take your pants off. And his secretary was sitting there. I said, don't you think you ought to ask Jane to leave the room? Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. Jane, would you mind stepping outside, please? He put the suit on me because the, the uh, measurements he got from me were the same as the measurements for the test pilot. And so they did whatever they had to do to, to uh, make it better than what it was. Well, at least you weren't the crash, the, uh, crash test dummy, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how long were you employed by David Clark? Not very long. At that point in time in my life, I was spending way too much time trying to emulate my older brother. And he was an Army officer, so I decided I was going to become an Army officer. So he was stationed at, at uh, the Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland. And I went down, this, this is almost unbelievable. Talk about not what you know, but who you know. So I go down there, and my brother sends me over to the post personnel officer, a captain in the Army who had been into France six times, and out again before D-Day. Yeah. Hmm. So he and I had a little chat about the war and stuff like that. And then he says, well, okay, I'm going to send you down to uh, A Company. Uh, instead of living in the barracks where the, all the, the uh, students live, I'm going to send you down to A Company picks up the phone, he calls the first sergeant, any company. I'm sending a man down, Paul Leahy. Uh, I want him, I want you to put him to, in the brick building. Never mind sending him down to the wooden barracks. Okay, so I got the wooden barracks. 
I mean, in the in the uh, where all the instructors for the different schools were housed, and uh, I went to a machinist school, and I was there for. Uh, I don't remember exactly. I might have been six month training as a as a machinist, and the man in charge came up to me after it was graduation, and he said, "I got some good news and some bad news for you. What do you want first? I said, "Give me the bad news." Well, he says, "You came out as the best student in the class, and but we can't give you the prize because your brother." Is in charge of this organization, and how would that look if his kid brother got the prize for being the best student? You know, I said, "Oh, that's fine, that's fine." So I uh, graduated, and uh, I went to. Uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And I was with an engineering battalion. And I had a truck that had the machines that I would need to work to make things and stuff. And that's when I decided I was going to go to OCS. So I applied for OCS and got accepted, went to OCS, went for 21 weeks out of a 24-week course. And because of that blow that I got in the back from that guy in Germany, I couldn't do one of the exercises. I couldn't do a sit-up. Today, I couldn't do a sit-up. Uh, so I was trying to get the minimum uh, score on four exercises instead of five. So I never passed a physical exam. We had one every month, and I never passed one of them. But I was in the top of the, well, the, the top third of the class in academics. So they let me keep going, keep going, keep going. Finally, they called me in and said, we're gonna have to let you go. You haven't passed a physical exam since you've been here. Undoubtedly, you'd make a fine officer in some branches of the service. However, when we uh, graduate here, it's graduate branch immaterial. So you may end up in the infantry or someplace like that. We don't think you could hack it because of your disability. And I actually, I had a disability from the VA for that back injury. Uh, there was a program that they would allow you to go back in the Army. And I think it was called a Circle Six. I don't know exactly what that meant, but uh, if you had, if you were able to dress and feed yourself, you were able to go back in the Army. Uh, so uh, I did, I, I, and with the sole purpose of going to OCS, and after I failed out of OCS, I was stationed uh, at camp at, at uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and I was a staff sergeant. And as a staff sergeant, I could do uh, charge of quarters, uh, sergeant of the guard. Uh, and in the army, the second time it was a lot different than it was the first time. If you had God do it, you didn't want to pull it. I could pull it for you for a price. I was making more money with doing things that I shouldn't have been doing, but I got away with. Uh, I would pull KP, I would pull uh, Private of the Guard, Sergeant of the Guard, uh, Charge of Quarters. And everybody knew that I was doing this, so they'd come up to me and say, hey, lady, I've got CQ, uh, you want to take it? Yeah, okay, fine, give me some money. Uh, one night I'm on CQ and I'm reading a, 
a uh, army regulation that stated the army had just instituted a new pay promise a policy. And if you were getting less money under the new regulation, you were eligible for discharge because that meant that the government had broken its contract with you. So I thought, hmm, I'm getting less money. <laughs> I was getting 47 cents a month less under the new pay plan than I was under the old. So I went to the first sergeant and I said, I'm gonna apply for discharge. On what grounds, he said. I said, I'm getting less money in the new. He said, how much? I said, 47. I said, well, that's not a hardship. He said, that's only, a, uh, that's only meant for people where it causes a hardship. I said, I read that AR from one end to the other, and the word hardship is not in it. So I said, I would like to apply for discharge. Now, all right, he said, it won't do you any good, but he said, I'll, I'll type it up for you. I said, okay. So he types it up. He didn't type it up, but the company clicked it. And uh, he took it to the first sergeant. He said, okay, I'll put it in the captain's in basket. So I said, do you mind if I take that into Captain Martin? He said, no, go ahead. So I went into Captain Martin. He gave me the same story he did. That only applies in cases where a hatch. I said, no, I don't think so, sir. I, you know. All right, he said, I'll send that up to VCO headquarters. I said, I'm going up to VCO headquarters. You mind if I take it up? No, 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 go ahead. So I took the thing, went out and commandeered a Jeep, went up to VCO headquarters, got in touch with a sergeant I used to drink with in the NCO club, who was in personnel. And I showed him the thing and he says, go pack your bag, you'll be a civilian in a week. And I was. Back to civilian life you go. <laughs> Back to civilian life I go, yeah. Back to Worcester? Back to Worcester, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. But not back to the same company. No, no. Because of my machinist training, I got a job working in a company. Uh, I wasn't doing any machine work. I was, it was a company that had a whole uh, line of screw machines and they produce a lot of chips and so I was the gun designated to take the chips out take them down to a spot where they spun them to get the oil off them but that's all I did day after day you know and one day I was uh, a minute late and then uh, the same week I was a couple of minutes late or something, getting to work. And uh, when I got my paycheck that week, I said, oh, wait a minute, I, I, this isn't what I should be getting. So I went up to the foreman, he said, well, let me take a look. I said, okay, so he said, well, let, let me look at something for a minute. And he, well, that's, you know what that is? He said, you were late one minute and they dock you half an hour. And if you're late the, the second time, they still dock you half an hour. You know? So he said, that's why you're missing that hour's pay. I said, oh, really? I said, when did they tell me that that was in effect, you know? Well, everybody here knows it. I said, well, I didn't know it. So I said, this is that. I don't think I want to work for this company. So another guy and I took the day off, and we went looking for a job. And we went on New Bond Street in Worcester. Norton Companies on one side, Heald Machine on the other side. Heald Machine came first, so we went to Heald Machine, and we left there thinking that we were both going to get a job. And it turned out that's exactly what happened. We got a job, I, both of us working for them in a machine shop. I was running a milling machine, and he was running a lathe. So that we never went looking, we never went to Norton Company, because we figured we had a job from Heels. Uh, so I gave my notice at at the other place and went to work for Heels Machine, and I was working and working, and I'm thinking, I really don't want to spend the rest of my life 
being plugged into a machine. You walk in, you plug yourself in in the morning, you pull out the plug in the afternoon, and you go home. So I quit. Went to work for Tom McCann selling shoes. And uh, I never did anything <clears throat> in my life that I enjoyed as much as that. I got paid so little. So I decided I didn't want to do that either. So I, w <laughs> I went to work for a co another company in Worcester as a machinist. And I bumped into a guy who I had worked with at Heald Machine. <clears throat> hey, I thought you didn't like working in machine shops. I said, well, I like eating. You know, so, so I went to work for, the, for this company. And after maybe two years or three years, my boss came, in to me, come in, came to me one day and he said, do you mind coming in early next week? Uh, I want you to go to the personnel department. Uh, they're going to give you a test. I said, OK. So I went in, took the test, went home, changed into my work clothes, and came back and went to work that night. Maybe two or three weeks later, he came up to me and said, do you mind coming in again next week, uh, tomorrow and early, and uh, take a test? And, and I said, no, OK. So I came in, and I took the test. and Never heard how I made out or anything like that. So the third test came up, and I went in and took the third test. So I went to him, and I said, hey, I've taken three tests, and I have never heard how I made out. He said, if you didn't pass the first one, you wouldn't have got to take the second one, and so forth. <laughs> so, OK. So the next thing he said to me, I want you to come to work early next Tuesday or whatever it will happen to be and uh, wear some decent clothes. You're going to go out to lunch. I said, OK. So he said, there's a man coming in from uh, Milwaukee, that's where their headquarters were. He's coming in, and it was a psychiatrist who I was having lunch with. And I, that day, I went home, changed my clothes after lunch, and came to work as I was working second shift. And uh, my boss came over to me. He said, it was about 5 o'clock. He was just leaving. He said, I can't talk to you much about it today. But he said, he gave me the green light on you. I said, oh, OK, what does that mean? He said, I'll talk to you tomorrow. I said, OK, fine. So he said, next Monday, I want you to, I'm going to make you an assistant foreman. And you, uh, you can, he said, you know, I wouldn't come in with a white shirt and tie. He said, just kind of ease into it with this, maybe a sports shirt or something like that. I thought to myself, I'm not ashamed of this. I'm putting him in with a shirt and tie whether he likes it or not. So I did. I wore a shirt and tie, and I was an assistant foreman. Then I began promoted to foreman, and then I got promoted to general foreman. And uh, I worked for them for. 13 years, and I was reporting to the general manager. The general manager got transferred to Milwaukee, so I got assigned to a, an engineer, and he asked me to do something that I didn't know how to do. So I said, well, I don't know how to do that. I don't know what that is. And I thought, well, you know, if he was a good supervisor, he would show me how to do it, and then I could go ahead and do it. You know, you don't know how to do that. You don't know how to. How did you ever get the job you got? So, uh, probably less than a week later, he called me into his office and he said, "I've got some bad news for you." I said, "Yeah, I know. You're going to fire me." How did you know that? He said. I said, "You have a real." security leak around here. I said, several people have come and told me that. 
that, I, that you were going to fire me this afternoon. Oh, well, well, who were they? I said, oh, I'm not going to tell you who they were. That's your problem. You figure out who they are. So he said, okay, you have to uh, go see the personnel manager. He'll explain your, your benefits and so on. And so I had been there for 13 years, so they gave me 13 weeks pay, severance pay. And uh, I'll talk about insurance and all that kind of good stuff. He said, by the way, the uh, general manager wants to talk to you. He had flown in from Milwaukee. He was out there on business, and he heard about my being let go, so he flew back into... So I said to him, you know, that was a, a lot of money and a lot of for nothing. I said, you're not going to change their decision, are you? Oh, no, I couldn't do that, Paul. I said, well, then what the hell did you come back for? Well, you were always a good employee. You've been here for 13 years, blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, fine. So I left with my 13 weeks severance pay, applied for a job at another company. And uh, I got hired at the other company. Okay. We are at the Museum of World War II Boston, and we're here with Paul Leahy to talk about some of the mortar rounds that we used during the war. Mr. Leahy. This is a 30 millimeter mortar uh, and it's fired by being dropped down a tube when it hits the bottom and explodes and goes up. And it has to travel a certain distance between, before it will uh, explode. It has to travel a certain distance through the air. And one time we were in a... a uh, pile of ammunition like this. And that story came out about the guy that was using him as hand grenades. And we had a man in our company named Kuliak. He was a sergeant. Uh, he's the biggest man I ever saw in my life. I used to travel with him all the time. I figured if the crowds can't hit him, they'll never be able to hit me. So anyway, uh, he took out one of these things out of a container and slammed it down on the top of a box of ammunition. If it had gone up, we would have all gone up in smoke. Uh, but he made his point that you can't use them as hand grenades. Now, what is the larger of the two mortar shells on this top? An 81 millimeter mortar. And what was that used for? Well, it was used by the heavy weapons companies. Uh, the rifle companies had the small one and the weapons companies had the large ones. Now, uh, before the interview, you mentioned that you received the French Legion of Honor, and I believe that's the uh, medal right there. Right. Uh, tell us a little more about uh, when you received it. First of all, you had to apply for it. And you, when you applied for it, you had to write a little... Uh, what you did during the war, especially when you were in France. Uh, and you had to submit that and your discharge to the French people, and then they decide whether you're going to get the medal or not. And uh, when I heard that I was going to get the medal and where it was going to be, it was going to going to be up at, uh, in uh, Vermont, Norwich University. And they put on a very nice ceremony. I got a picture there and then the stuff that I bought in of the day that I was awarded the medal. And when did you receive it? In 2006. Paul, how important was it for you to serve in the military? Oh, very important. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up this interview? No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, Paul Leahy, we thank you so much for coming to the Museum of World War II Boston and taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. 
Thank you very much for having me. Mm -hmm.